Hey everybody, welcome back to the Follow Me Podcast, a Christian Leaders Podcast, powered by Greg Fay Insurance. If you haven't talked to my man Greg Fay, do so today. Go to GregFayInsurance.com. Back on the podcast, my dear friend, my spiritual mentor, Chaplain Charles Causey. Charles has got a brand new book out about relating to each other. It's called Relate. And in this discussion, we talk about leadership. We talk about uh, leading with our personality in mind. It's such a great conversation. Obviously, you know that I adore Charles. He's one of my dearest friends. And I'm so excited for all the things that God is doing in his life. And I know that his writing is going to be such a gift to you. So let me also tell you that there is a free assessment with this writing. There's a link in the show notes. We'll be sure to put it there. Uh, you can sign up to, to take his personality profile test as a way to relate to other people and the people that you lead. So I know you're going to enjoy this conversation. And without any further ado, here's my conversation with Chaplain Charles Causey. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm so excited today to have a longtime friend since September of 2007, mentor, spiritual father. Uh, he's a big reason I am who I am today. Been on the podcast multiple times, the legendary Charles Causey. Charles, it's good to have you back. Thank on. you, Tony. What a pleasure. Uh, it's great to see you and to have this opportunity to share and talk and catch up. And yeah, you've been one of my closest friends for over 15 years. So thank you for that. That's wild. It's wild. We've been through a lot of stuff together. And uh, and listen, I, I wanted to start with some big life news for you career-wise. Um, can you tell the podcast family the news that uh, that we all are celebrating um, about your army career. Uh, well, thanks. Yes, I am going to be promoted to general officer here in a few days and the army has made that decision. It's nothing I ever thought would happen. Um, but excited to continue service for another few years for the army in that capacity. Charles, one of the things I love about you is that you're such a humble leader. Uh, if you're not familiar with the army ranks, like general officer is, it's really elite air, right? Like it's not many people make it there in, in their career. And um, it's one of those things that it's um, it's just not easy to attain, especially if you're aiming for it. And one of the things I know about you is that you, you never really wanted this. This wasn't a career goal. You were perfectly content to, um, to retire as a colonel and just continue to serve. And, and I'm kind of curious um, how – how do you interpret these kind of life events where something that is this tremendous blessing that you didn't really want and yet here you are? Like, how, how do you process that through the lens of your faith and your leadership? Well, my first thought is that it's an expression of God's will in our life. Uh, he's revealing his will for us. Like I, like you said, I was perfectly content to leave the army here in the next few months um, and go about uh, ministry, but with this promotion, I am, I have to hang on to the army for another three years. <laughs> and, um, it, it, <laughs> it's revelatory in that this is God, you know, man plans his steps, but God directs him and God is directing, yeah. uh, where we're going to live and what we're going to be doing for the next three years. And in one sense, you step back and you just say, thank you, God. It's great to know your will for our lives. In another sense, there's just kind of surprise. And and um, I, I would never say I'm, I'm sad because of this or mourning, but you do. It does change what you were planning to do. Um, some of the dreams you had with your spouse, you know, starting retirement and things like that. Um, so Lori maybe has had to adjust more than I have. If that makes sense. Yeah, it, it's it, it's interesting. Is um, one of the things that I appreciate about our friendship is that you're just slightly ahead of me in seasons, right? And and so uh, I've watched you and Lori become closer over the years as as empty nesters. When I first met you, you were of course your home was full of of kiddos, and uh, and since even since the last time you've been on the podcast. Um, you've grown your family through marriage. 
Uh, what advice do you have for the leaders that are listening who, who are entering that season where their kids are thinking about marriage and they're, I mean, you, you really have fully transitioned to that, that next yeah, season. Yeah, this is, this is an exciting interlude uh, before grandchildren season. From what I hear, uh, we have some friends that are our age or even younger that are already grandparents and they have like two, three, four grandkids. And, um, but we're in this special season before grandkids where we had three kids get married in a matter of, uh, a year and a half, I think. And, um, the, uh, the exciting part is that we have gained three members to our family that we're still getting to know and loving and appreciating and spending time with. So when we had like Cosy Christmas this last Christmas, instead of the six, it was the nine. And we're playing, we're duking it out in board games and we had a swimming pool. We were like horses around <laughs> and you get to see different sides of people and their personality types. And so of course, all three of those that have joined our family, which we love, they're just dear people, but they came from different backgrounds, uh, different ways their parents brought them up. And uh, sure. so they're trying to adapt to our culture and we're trying to adapt to them. And it's, it's a lot of fun, uh, but it's wonderful. These all three that are kids have married are just wonderful people. So we're thrilled. Uh, we are ready for that next stage too, but we're enjoying this stage to have a little larger family right now with adults. <laughs> yeah, I heard a quote recently that said, uh, parenting is one of the only um, only relationships that as the relationship grows older, it becomes less intimate. Um, and I'm wondering what your reflections on that are uh, with with your kids, because I know you've always been close to your kids. It's one of the things I love about you. Uh, I, uh, that's a great question, Tony. Um, so obviously they have this huge other connection in their life that they're more intimate with and they share everything with. So your role does change some. You know, they're not, uh, let's say, crying to you or triumphing with you on a day-to-day -day basis. But the role has changed. It's almost like you've become a seasoned mentor in their life instead of this person that they're in this day-to-day -day relationship with. You might get a phone call every week or two. Hey, Dad, I, I'm doing this, or what do you say about this? Um, instead of the day-to-day tears and triumphs, if that makes sense. So it, it mm. it's an adjustment. It's hard. There's, there's some oh, loneliness so. attached to that when for Lori and I, because they were such a huge part of our everyday life. You know, we had four kids in five years. So three of them were in high school at the same time. And it was pretty intense. And now it, the house is very quiet and it is an adjustment. We miss them tremendously, but we're thrilled for them. And we're, we love our in-laws. Uh, you literally moved your wife uh, from uh, paradise in Hawaii, where you were last stationed, to now being on the East Coast. Um, every move, I feel like I, I watch you and Lori kind of grow a little bit closer and find new ways to connect. When you guys get to a new place or enter a new season, what do you? What are some of the practices that you guys do to ground your marriage? Yeah, another great question. So, um, we, well. Obviously, faith is a huge part of our life, so we are excited. We have a journey of trying to find a new church, trying to plug into a small group, trying to meet the pastor, and because that that's going to be, and we know in retirement, I mean, that's going to be a large part of our life. We want to invest a lot of time in our church and in our faith family. So, uh, and with Lori, with the military, there's this added um, bonus. She got plugged into a group that it's not always easy for Army Reserve spouses to get plugged in, but it's called PWOC, Protestant Women of the Chapel. And she started going to meetings and Bible studies and meeting people and then helping out with um, events that they were, you know, they needed people to help out with. And so that's a whole other community for Lori. So at the end of the day, we have a lot to talk about with where, you know, we've respectively been and what we've been doing and we catch up. Um, but it is different. It, it is a different season for us. And we're still trying to figure it out. We've had a lot of travel the last few months, even though we just moved to this new area. So still trying to get a heart heartbeat going for 
routine. You guys spent, uh, was it six years in Hawaii? No, I was there four and a half, okay. and Lori was there three. three and a half. One of the things, the stories that I remember about your time in Hawaii was during COVID when um, when the island kind of just shut down, and you, you shared with me some stories about how you were snorkeling. Um, just, you know, the days just felt and looked different in terms because everything was shut down and Hawaii was especially strict during that time period, rightfully so. Um, and then, you know, you were trying to navigate the, the waters pun intended as best you could. I, I'm curious, what was your biggest um, takeaway or reflection from your time in that place? From our, my entire time in Hawaii or Hawaii with COVID? Yeah. In Hawaii, in, in the entire time in Hawaii, I just felt like you connected with Hawaii in a way that I hadn't seen you connect with the duty station up to that point. Well, here is something, it just came to my mind. I've never thought of this before, but I really believe paradise is where you have healthy relationships that you're connected with all the time. Uh, it's mm -hmm. not a location. It's not an activity. It really has to do with your faith in God and your connection with other people. And if we hadn't had people that visited us routinely, um, you know, Lori has the gift of hospitality and we had people in our home constantly, you know, it was a revolving door. We lived on the ocean and um, you and your family came, which we were so excited to have you there with your kids. And uh, so, Without that, I, I, don't, I believe Hawaii would have been a very lonely, uh, sort of depressing mm -hmm. place. It's beautiful, but beauty can only take you so far. It's it's shallow. It's superficial. Um, you have to. It's almost like salt. It, it needs to be seasoned with people and relationships to really bring out the taste of it. And it, like so. Snorkeling alone and swimming alone and walking on the beach alone during COVID, it was uh, meditative and prayerful. Um, I learned, but because I knew it was just for a, a short season, I was able to get through it um, and enjoy it in, in a way. If that was my permanent life, I think I would have gone crazy because you have to have people. Mm. You really do. You, you need healthy relationships in your life to share these experiences with. Otherwise, they don't mean much. That's actually the perfect segue into your latest bit of writing. Um, Relate is all about unlocking the power of personality types to strengthen your relationships. And, and what I see in this writing more than anything is this um, is a continuation of that statement of how important relationships are to you. How did kind of God put this topic on your heart? When did you know it was time to lean into writing a book all about personality types and relationships? Uh, I, with all of my books, Tony, I, I, I'm not the kind of person that I've charted out like in five years from now, I'm going to write about the Holocaust and five years from now, I'm going to write about this and five years from now. So I'm the kind of person where God just strongly put something on my heart and I remember when I was driving to my dad's house in New Jersey and I felt like I was supposed to write about candor. And before I got to my dad's house, I felt like the Holy Spirit and God was just already downloading illustrations, stories, explanations about candor and how to get that message out. And with relationships, uh, I think part of it had to do with a lot of people that were visiting our house and I was doing research at the time for the last three years, doing research on how to get a different model um, than our current ones that our forefathers who are very wise, brilliant people, uh, scientists, uh, Myers-Briggs, Kiersey, the DISC people, uh, and the Enneagram. But I was trying to get one that people could, I, I was working on a model that would be easy to remember and that people could enjoy with their family and, and learn about how to have healthy relationships without a ton of science and a ton of vocational stuff attached to it. They can sink their teeth in because most people only give a book a few minutes 
uh, to get in. They don't want a deep, like a, like a textbook. They want something relational that they can apply immediately. And so we're having all these people come to visit us and I was developing my new assessment tool. So I was able to use it on everybody that came through that. <laughs> and it just seemed like I got more and more data and it kept validating itself and people were loving it. And so in a way, the book was written in the years that we lived in Hawaii and all the people that visited us in ways for me to test the assessment. So I tested hundreds of people. Um, it wasn't just visitors, though. I was able to test churches, youth groups, schools, things like that. But um, yeah, I got a lot of information. I was like, I've got to get this out. Posting a book, as you know, it's kind of like giving birth <laughs> in a way that you, you have to, it, there's a time for the baby to come out. It can't just stay in there anymore, you know? And it's like, yeah, every book, if it stays in, it just doesn't, it doesn't feel right. So you got to get it out. And I had to get this book out and it finally just came out last month. Hey guys, just pausing this conversation with Charles to remind you to check out our sponsors. Trent Barga over at the Barga team wants to help you get into your next home, whether that's an investment home, vacation home, or forever home. Talk to Trent today. Uh, re the real estate market now is the perfect time to buy. It's not going to get any better. Don't wait. Waiting only makes it worse. Talk to Trent. Go to the thebargateam.com. There's a link in the show notes. As always, we're so thankful for his partnership. Also, another one of our partners that I got to shout out is Five Star Home Services. Go to myfivestarhomeservices.com, get signed up for their HVAC plumbing and electrical needs. I just know you're absolutely going to love this company. They have a profit on purpose mentality. They want to help you uh, live into the fullness of your home in ways intended to be used. So don't wait for that summer AC rush. Get your AC checked out today. Go to myfivestarhomeservices.com and tell them Tony sent you. Now let's finish up this conversation with Charles. One of the things I love to do um, is a, a, as just a general practice when I put a book in my hands is read the dedication page. In this particular book, you dedicated to Calvin, Carol, and Nathaniel. I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about um, why them, why this book. Well, that, those are my three older brothers and sisters and uh, sister. And they've always been there in my life. Uh, my brother Calvin's 11 years older, Nathaniel's, or Carol's eight years older, and Nathaniel's seven years older. So there was a gap, but they were always around me. And they would visit, you know, in, when they were in college, they would come back home, and my brothers would play football with me, or my sister would do things with me. And we were close growing up. We played a lot of board games. We spent a lot of time. They invested in me. And since then, they've remained the last 30 years, 40 years, three of my best friends of all time. And we're still close today. We still call. We still talk. We still visit. We text a million times. And I knew at some point I wanted to dedicate a book to them. I didn't know when, which book, if I would keep writing. But when I'm writing a book about relationships, I thought, wow, these three They've been there my entire, like ever since I was born, they drove to the hospital to visit my mom and I on their bikes. <laughs> and it was Christmas day or something like that. Cause I was born uh, the evening, the 23rd and uh, they were allowed to come visit me in their new bikes that they got for Christmas. So they've always been. There. That's incredible. I love that. I, I can't believe I've never heard that story before. That's amazing. <laughs> Um, take us through the relate acronym, because one of the things I appreciate about the way that you set this up is that you're going through the different personality types, but really, um, you use relate as both a way to re put handles around what they are and what it looks like. So kind of give everyone the overview of the six personality types in the acronym relate. So relate is an acronym for the six types and it stands for role model, energizer, Loyalist, uh, assertive, trailblazer, and expressive. And three of those types are in the executive family, and three of those types types are in the explorer family. But I wanted I wanted the model to be simple, explainable, and that when you get a type, it's not cold, meaning it's not a number or just letters. 
It's not telling somebody, well, I'm a three with a wing six, but under stress, I'm a two with a wing seven. I mean, when somebody tells me that and I don't know the Enneagram very well, it doesn't do much for me. Or when somebody tells me I'm an ISTJ or I'm an ENFP, it just doesn't, it, it doesn't mean as much unless you really study those concepts and understand what those letters mean. But when somebody tells me they're a role model, the descriptive is in the name of the personality type on, on some of the things they achieve to be. You know, they are out there doing good for people. Uh, it, it, it's, it's really organic in their personality type to help people, to be an example for others, and to serve and to graciously, dutifully do their task. And I can say that for each of the six, the Energizer and the Trouble. Well, I, I think uh, people should pick up a copy of the book to get into all six, but there might be a couple that we should explore. Um, l- let's start with... Um, Let's start with mine. Actually, that'll be that'll be pretty relatable. Most of the podcast family knows uh, my personality, and um, and so it's a good way to kind of go through it, and and probably fairly relatable. Um, so, do you want to take us through the uh, the Energizer? Absolutely, yeah. So, Energizers are warm, friendly, upbeat people. Um, they're eager to try new ideas. They are flexible in group settings. They can be the life of the party and tell interesting stories. And I think, Tony, you fit all of the things I've just said. <laughs> the ability to make routine tasks fun and exciting. Um, and you can find satisfaction in a variety of settings. You have a contagious enthusiasm. Uh, and you have the ability to change gears quickly. And you're bold and you're willing to step out of your comfort zone. Um now, obviously, there's no, I've, I've told everybody, there's not one type that's better than the others. All of them are just very super special and and needed in this cornucopia of, of types. And I believe there's six, yep. six of those. But you guys are, your hallmark is that you're the enthusiastic people. And your predominant goal is to have fun with them. And that's why people love you so much. <laughs> have you ever <laughs> asked, let me turn the table on you. Have you ever asked yourself, why are you loved so much from other, by other people? I don't know that that's a question I've, I've routinely asked others. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I, I like to think I'm pretty fun in most settings. <laughs> you are, you are, you're fun to be around, you're enthusiastic, you like to tell stories and have humor, and you're a blessing to talk to, you know, regularly, and I think that has probably endeared you, I know it has endeared you to a ton of people, and attracted people to yourself, and you have a lot of deep relationships and connections, and people feel close to you soon after they meet you. There's mm. not this gap period of having to really find out who Tony is because you let people know who you are because you want to be involved with them and relate to them and they see your heart and they see not just the superficial fun stuff on the outside, but that you're a real person and enduring and have, you know, tender feelings and emotions too. And you let it all out there. And like you described yourself, you're just a heart with arms on it or legs on it or ears on it or something. <laughs> can't remember how you described Man, that. that but when was a big old heart with arms, I think. <laughs> but uh yeah we uh you're a very important member of the relate family and you're and it you're just one of those great people to have on a team um that people love hmm. they really do so what about you how did you test out on the six personality type oh now you're getting personal I didn't, I tried to be as objective as possible and not like paint it uh, anything around my personality or what I liked or didn't like. But so I would wait until I had the assessment, uh, you know, in a more mature form, but then I tested out as a troublemaker. And that makes sense to me because my brain is just always on. I mean, these people are independent and they're adventurous and inquisitive and they can't turn it off. They're very conceptual and they have, uh, they come up with a lot of plans and ideas. Half of them don't work, but, (laughs) 
we, we're great to have on a team because we're the ones that can just help generate different ideas and different ways to do things. We're not socially cooperative. We're utilitarian, which means that we're trying to find the best way, not the way that maybe is mm-hmm. most accepted in society. One of the things I appreciate about um, even just the quick glance of the, the, um, the personality types is that you talk about potential b- blind spots you know, and for for yours at the Trailblazer, it says there's a a tendency to get easily bored and restless. You learn much more. Uh, you know, you have this. It's hard for you to sit still and not do something. Have you found that to be true in your experience? Yes, I think that's why it's there's been books produced <laughs> in my life <laughs> is because I've always got to have like another two or three secret hobbies going on. You know, where I'm 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 doing. Things. Yeah, they are secret. They are. I never know when you're, you're probably writing a book right now, aren't you? <laughs> no. no. As I've told the launch team a few days ago, this given birth to this book has taken everything on me, getting the online assessment up and going and getting the launch team. And I, I, I'm not doing anything. In fact, another guy asked if I wanted to co-author a book. I said, I'd be glad to co-author a book, but it's all you right now. Like, I've got nothing. I've got nothing. It's got to be your ideas. <laughs> Your initial right. I I have given everything, my heart and soul, to getting this relate material out of me and into the public. One of the interesting things about the way that you wrote the book is that you kind of go through the uh, the different assessments, but then um, there's a part that I really enjoyed, which was the kind of this middle summary, like and an, um, this middle section of summary, and and you get really creative. It, this is uh, like super fun kind of cheeky uh creativity here in the middle of the book where you're like what type of vehicle for example this is an example of one of the things in there what type of vehicle would it would each um personality type be let me just read a couple so you guys can get a feel for this if you're the role model then you uh would probably drive a pickup truck the energizer a hot air balloon which a hot air balloon sounds amazing to me the loyalist a gondola ski lift Assertive, a bulldozer, trailblazer, a rocket ship, expressive, a sports convertible. You also then go on to talk about uh, four, dif- you know, four different questions and what how they would respond. Occupations that begin with the letter S. I, how did you? The, I, I I bring all this up because it's it's such a deep dive into each personality. How did you come up with this kind of like fun, lighthearted? kind of thought process to the personality types? Well, I think it goes back to the, the time I had in Hawaii during COVID, like on a weekend, and it was just me. Lori hadn't moved there yet. And I would be paddle boarding down this river in a jungle. <laughs> and I was just playing with these ideas. Like I thought, okay, how, how are the types different? Like what if I asked each of the types, what if a tree fell in the woods and nobody was around to hear it? How would each of the types res- – and I was just having fun. I was like, well, the role model would be like, of course it makes a sound. Is this a trick question? And the energizer would say, no, wait a minute. What did you say happened in the woods? Because <laughs> <You know? laughs> they're, so, they're so excited about the moment and doing other things. It's like all of a sudden they have to tune back in. Wait, what were you just talking about? Um, the loyalists would say, well, I feel it would make a noise, but whatever you decide is fine with me. The assertive would say, I don't have time for these pointless discussions. <laughs> the trailblazer would say, why is it that you get to ask the questions? And the expressives would say, are we best friends? You know, and I just, I got a kick out of that. And I thought, wait, which one's your wife? My wife is an assertive. And that's how I knew <laughs> that the response I knew. to this question would be, I don't have time for these Point. Charles, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so it's so great. I, I knew exactly who Lori was by the way that you answered that question. So as you begin to lead others, I, I'm curious. You're you're going to be leading at a really high level, working with lots of teams. How do you plan on using this tool? as you um, lean into more and more teams in the army and with all the different communities that you intersect with? Uh, Yeah. Great question, Tony. And um, part of 
what I've been working on is for when I depart from the Army to have some tools that the Army can use. Obviously, there's a little bit of a conflict of interest with me publishing and producing material and being a leader in the Army. So I'm very careful not to mix the two, just to have undue influence and anything like that. But I am uh, constantly preparing and planning for the next stage of life when I am out of the Army. And I'm really hoping that this will be, along with some other of my materials, to be uh, strong um, reference material for education for soldiers and warriors to relate to their spouses, their kids, their family members, and, and the teams that they're working on. We have a program in the Army called Building Strong and Ready Teams. It used to be called the Strong Bonds Program. Mm. And I, I believe that self-awareness is, is very important um, in leadership and in teamwork. And to understand how to lead with humility instead of ego and narcissism. And these are all concepts in the book, how to give and grant forgiveness, um, mm. how to live a purpose-filled life, but how to, how to work with people in a way that communicates love and respect to them. It might not be the way you receive and give identify with other people and love them in a way that's meaningful to them. So I, I'm sort of building um, building a lot of uh, tools in my toolbox so that I can produce great materials for the military, for warriors all across the spectrum, all over the world that they can use to become their people. That's my plan. One of the things that's interesting about the book is that it's not overtly Christian. It's it's what I would call sneaky Jesus, and I can kind of see some of your faith in the book, but it's not um, it's you know it's not super you know expository in scripture or anything like that, apologetics or any of those kind of things. How do you decide as a Christian leader when to like lean into that part of? Uh, your identity and when to um, be a little softer with it? Yeah, good question. I think it, it has to do with what audience you're writing to or speaking to. And just it's really, <clears throat> that's being sensitive to the Holy Spirit and how God wants you to communicate a message. I mean, I have some stories where I've written for Christian book publishers that I would have thought they wanted more scripture and Jesus in it, and they were coming back saying, no, you got to take this out. You got to take this verse out. You can't use this spiritual language because they were trying to write to a bigger audience, a more general audience. And that was weird for me because that's the core of who I am and my faith. So as you notice and relate, for instance, when I wrote the forgiveness chapter, I said, for me, forgiveness uh, and a, a large uh, parcel, it goes back to my faith and who I am is why I give it. Uh, forgiveness and my whole identity of needing forgiveness and giving forgiveness. But I realizing I'm writing to a larger audience, I want to explain forgiveness in ways that um, people that don't have a faith background can understand because it is important for all humans, um, not just those with faith. Because people without faith, I mean, they struggle just as much or if not more than folks with faith. Yeah, amen to that. Um, w one of the crazy things is that you really have put a ton of work in developing this online, um, platform so that people can take the tests and, and you're even giving all of this away for free at, at six personalities.com. Um, you know, you've built, I've known you for a long time. You've built assessments before, but this is such a, a in-depth kind of full assessment of who people are. What kind of process did you go through putting this all on the internet and making it accessible for anybody to use at a really basic but um, helpful level? Yes. Well, I I changed my mind a lot. That's what, <laughs> on what to give and, and how to set it up. And I talked to some mentors and some different people and just getting advice. And I realized my goal was that I wanted as many people to use it as possible. So I wanted it to be free. 
I wanted it to be without them having to add an email uh, where they would suspect that they would get, you know, follow on emails to buy more things. I feel like they have all the information they need on the sixpersonalities.com website. If they wanted to buy something, they could buy something. If they're, if they're already there taking the assessment, it's not like I'm going to send them an email to say, hey, go to this website or buy these products. I mean, they're already there. So I just thought to get as many people, and I know that uh, people I work with, they want to have their kids and their cousins and their grandkids or whatever take this test. And I don't want to make it harder for them than it needs to be. Now, if they want a deeper dive than the information that I have on the internet, there are ways you could either buy a single profile for you know, two or three dollars. You can get your, you know, the role model profile or the assertive profile if you didn't want to buy the whole book. But what's great is the entire the, the book, it gives you everything. It's got all the profiles. It's got how all the types relate with each other. And it's got all the extra material about teamwork and forgiveness and, um, and narcissism and humility and also about having a purpose in life. One of the things I know about my podcast family is that they love to pray. And so as this book enters into the world, what can we be praying alongside you as God um, has his hand on this new writing for you? Prayer. I never... I never shy away from an opportunity to receive prayers. And I would just pray that God would use this book and these materials and resources in a way that would heal families, heal parents with their children, heal marriages, heal best friends. We're also, as I get older, you see situations where people haven't spoken to their elderly parents for years or to their sibling, let's say a parent has passed away or they had to deal with a mm. will. And so many times I've heard from people that, you know, dealing with an estate brings out the worst in people and um, how they, um, you know, severed relationships because of the way people acted. So my, my hope and prayer, what I would ask people to pray for is that this book and this material would, would be a healing agent, a salve, a bomb to the soul to reconcile people with the Lord, but also most, mostly with each other. As you said, this is not an evangelistic book. Yeah. There are other resources on the web for that, and, and I have other resources. You and I, in our book, Unbreakable, um, we talk about how marriage is connected to God, and we go right to his character and to his identity. And I don't believe you can read through our book, Unbreakable, without understanding how to have a true faith in Christ. This book is a little different. It's really a, a knife, a sharp tool to use to get right to the heart of healing and helping relationships. That's so good. Uh, okay, I have one more question for you, but before I ask it, I know that everyone's going to want to connect with you. Can you kind of tell everybody what they can do to stay in tune with your writing uh, besides going to sixpersonalities.com, or is that really the place to start everywhere? That's it. Yeah, sixpersonalities.com, and there's a there's an author books page on there if you want to find more references. There's also uh, a chance to get in touch with me, and I welcome feedback from people if they want to write, if they want more information, or if something's not working right for them on on the web materials that we have. I welcome to hear from them. But yeah, right now my my major focus right now, Tony, is still being active duty in the army, and and um, that's where. God has called me right now and where we're investing all of our time. This is more of a hobby and it'll take on more meaning once I retire. But, uh, but I do welcome feedback and any way I can help people in the relationships. I'd love to do it. I'm hoping in retirement, you can become a regular guest on the podcast. <laughs> love to be. It's just, a great podcast. It would just give us an opportunity to connect yeah. in such a powerful way and people would love it. Uh, okay. Last question. Um, you know, I, I love to ask people advice questions. Um, I, I, as you step into this new season of your life as a, as a general officer, as a, a parent uh, with grown kids and, uh, and hopefully someday you soon, if, if God calls your kids to that grandkids and, what all that looks like. Um, the question that I want to ask you is if, if you could give one piece of advice to a brand new leader 
maybe maybe a young, young lieutenant, maybe a, a, a new sales executive, may, somebody who's just stepping into um, a leadership role for the first time. You've written multiple books on leadership from candor to uh, to relate and everything in between. What's the one piece of advice you're giving to a brand new leader who's getting ready to take charge uh, of people for the first time? I would say this. Occupy your space and don't shrink back from it. And mm. deliver on your promises and commitments. Be a person of integrity. It can take a moment to lose a lifetime of integrity in relationships. Uh, things that you've built your whole life can fall in a moment without having a heart connected to God and just being a faithful steward. So those are, those are basically, I think that's like three or four things there, but those are what I <laughs> immediately come good. to mind. Yeah. That's so good. Uh, Charles, as always, it's such a joy to talk to you. I, you know, I love you and love your family and just thankful for our friendship and the way that you poured into my life over the years and can't wait to see what God does next for both of us. I love you too, Tony. And it's so great to talk to you. And I saw Karen for a glimpse this morning and your beautiful family and exciting news you have for Connor. And it's all just so wonderful. Uh, we love you guys. And so thankful that God brought you into our lives. What a great conversation with Charles. I absolutely just love his spirit. I love his friendship. I love the way he works uh, to help you relate to other people. This is such an important topic. I think all of us need to learn how to be better leaders as followers and as friends to the people in our life. Uh, don't forget to go sign up and take his self-exam today. That's for free. You can go to causybooks.com. We'll put a link in the show notes. Guys, that's it for me today. So thankful for you. Thankful for all of our sponsors, Greg Fay Insurance, The Barga Team, and My5StarHomeServices.com. And most of all, I'm thankful for you that we continue to lean into this exercise and without you, this wouldn't be worth it. So that's it for me today. I want to invite you to reach out. If you have any questions at TWML or follow the number two lead coaching.com. And remember guys, if you want to follow Jesus, you must be willing to move. <laughs>